Hey everyone, Vincenzo Calla here. Welcome to episode 16 of Let's Discuss Politics. Today, I'm glad to be joined by the Member of Parliament for Durham and the former leader of the Conservative Party of Canada, the Honourable Aaron O'Toole. Aaron was first elected to represent Durham in a 2012 by-election, then again in 2015, 2019, and 2021. Aaron enrolled in the Royal Canadian Air Force when he was 18 and attended the Royal Military College. His time in the RCAF took him across Canada, completing basic training in Chilliwack, British Columbia, earning his wings in Winnipeg, Manitoba, and serving out of Halifax, Nova Scotia as a navigator on Sea King helicopters and sailing with the Royal Canadian Navy. After 12 years of service in the uniform, Aaron retired from the military and spent the next decade working in the private sector as a corporate lawyer for two large Canadian law firms. In the Harper government, he served as the Minister of Veterans Affairs, and Aaron was elected as leader of Canada's Conservatives and became leader of the official opposition from 2020 and served until 2022, winning the popular vote in the 2021 Canadian election. Thank you, Aaron, for joining me today. Thank you, Vincenzo. Look forward to it. It's great to have you here today, and we're going to start off with the first segment, which is called Aaron's Story, where we'll talk about your political history. So the first question I like to ask everybody is, when did you really first start to get involved in politics? Like, when was the moment that sort of started it all for you? Well, I grew up in a family that <clears throat> followed politics and followed uh, activities in our community, that sort of thing. Uh, but when I was in the military, my father ran for provincial office, so he ran to be an MPP at Queen's Park as part of the Mike Harris Common Sense Revolution of 1995. So that's when I really was exposed to par partisan politics and the sort of thrill of a campaign, that sort of thing. So from that point on, I was always interested and I thought one day I might give this a shot myself, uh, depending on the circumstances and that sort of thing. And But that was really the interest like many people started through through their family's involvement in in politics or community building. Well, I mean, for sure, that's the way that a lot of people get involved. And in. I mean, uh, yourself, you've, you've seen that and you you obviously experience it and then you decide to run on your own. So it's 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 great to see how everybody gets to gets into politics. That's something I always like to see with this show. So the first, the next question I wanted to ask is why did you decide to run for the position you hold? So why did you decide to run to be MP for Durham? Well, it, you know, I often say I'm so proud to represent the communities I grew up in. So Durham is part of the Durham riding in Southern Ontario in the greater Toronto area. I grew up in Bowmanville and in Port Perry as a kid, uh, the two kind of largest centers in the riding I now represent. My dad worked at General Motors. He was a school trustee and, and involved in building the arena as a volunteer, these sorts of things. So in many ways, I'm a product of the community that I was raised in. And so years later, after I'd served in the military, after I'd served, uh, worked in the corporate world, I was already a volunteer in the community, working with the Rotary Club and the Legion, these sorts of things. And when my MP resigned suddenly, there was a window. It was a few years earlier than, than our family had been planning, perhaps, but there was an opportunity to be seized. And so that's why I got in it. It's my, my community, and I've always said it's been an honor to represent my community in Parliament, whether I sit in the front row or in the back row in the House of Commons, it's really about being a strong and, and respected voice for your community. Well, I mean, that's that's the whole part of being a, a member of Parliament. The people of Durham have now re-elected you uh, a, few, a few times now. So they obviously um, chose you to continue being their, their, their MP. So uh, serving them and serving, no matter what riding you're in, serving the people that elected you to 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 give them a voice on parliament, like you said, whether in the front row or the back row, it's equally important. So we're going to go into the next segment, which is called serving as an elected official, where we'll talk about your experiences and achievements as an elected official. So the first question talks about your community and serving it. So I wanted to ask, what is your favorite part about serving your community as an elected official? Um, I think my favorite part would be being a voice for the voiceless. And sometimes if people feel um, they've not been heard by the government or some of the systems that we see not working well, right now we see everything not working well from passports to airport travel through to, to patent filings, copyright filings. It doesn't seem like the federal government can do anything in a, in a productive manner. Um, probably some of my best 
experiences as an MP over the last decade were when uh, I was able to help families get reunited with a loved one who had been shot down through the immigration process or the immigration and refugee board and, and hearings not going well. And my team working with them, finding an error made. And in one case, I'll never forget reuniting a woman with her daughter after about 15 years, uh, whenever they come in our office, my whole staff uh, burst into tears and they burst into tears. And I've even had a few tears because that's where you realize you can have a real impact on people's lives. And, and sometimes the rhetoric and the theater in the House of Commons is a distraction from the real work you can, you can bring helping people if you're willing to, to be a fighter, to, to dig into the issues. So I often think some of those immigration cases are probably some of the most meaningful because you're actually helping uh, unite, reunite a family, or in some cases address um, a real hole in someone's life in, in, in terms of this mother that, that our team helped. So those are the real wins. You don't always get wins like that, but you, you fight for your people the best way you can. Well, I mean, being able to, to even help somebody like that must bring so much joy to your day. If, if you just like some things to you as a member of parliament may be very easy to do or get done as you can pull strings or that sort of thing in Ottawa and you have those contacts. But for some people, they may be the biggest things going on in their lives. And to be able to help them with that thing, even though it may be small to you, it may change their life for, yeah. for that. Well, th th this one case I often cite as my most meaningful contribution, not being leader, not being a cabinet minister, was actually helping this mother who had come to Canada under different circumstances. In fact, Canada had uh, brought her here in many ways to help raise two orphaned refugee children, but she had to leave a daughter behind and, and it impacted her every day. She was depressed. They, um, you know, English was a second language and they hadn't fared well through the court and tribunal process. So for our team to give it a second look and then find that there were some errors made in my view and I took it to the minister and um, it changed their life. You know, Lex, now they're, she's productive. It's been a hole that's been filled. So there, you can't put a price on that. So I'm, I've, I've had a remarkable number of successes in other files, but nothing is more meaningful than bringing someone um, that piece of, of, of reuniting a family. For sure. And, and I think we won't spend much time on this because I'm pretty sure you, ju you just kind of gave the answer to this question and that answer. But the question is, what is your favorite achievement as an elected official? And, and are there, I'm sure that's probably one of the biggest, but are there any other little points as well, maybe for, for, I don't know, to answer this question? <laughs> Yeah, you know, thanks, Vincenzo. You know, when you were reading my bio, which, you know, I've heard many times on many Zoom calls, because in many ways, I was the Zoom leader elected in the pandemic and did most of my work on Zoom. But if you look at it, all those elections, first in a by-election, my second, I was a cabinet minister and one of the lead people in the 2015 election. Third one was uh, as a leading critic who had not won the leadership. The previous one was as leader, and we won the popular vote. Each role I've had in public life brings positive experiences. I've told you probably the most meaningful one is that one uniting a mother and her daughter. Nothing really can, can cap that really. As veterans minister, um, resolving a lawsuit, at least temporarily brought by veterans towards their own government, um, that took the work of my entire team, some of which were veterans, to win trust with people that had lost the trust so much with the system that they were they were in court. So for us to be able to resolve that, at least temporarily, showed that we not only understood the issues, we had empathy and tried to build common cause. And if, if I see anything right now in politics, particularly through the pandemic, it's the decline of empathy. People uh, are resolute in their position on left or right and don't even want to put themselves in the shoes of other people. Um, I was very proud that my team did that. I did that as minister. And it, it led to a, a temporary win. And so I think if you, if you have a great team, if you really try and, and strive to, to be a leader that listens, you can have great success. Some, some great advice and some great words there. 
So we're going to go into the next segment, which is called Politics All Around Us, where I like to talk about sort of the world of politics that surrounds us. So I wanted to ask you, I like to ask this first, is who is or who was another politician that has inspired you or continues to inspire you as, a, as an MP? Um, obviously, my, my father was my formative influence in, in politics. I, I saw him as a community volunteer, a trustee and a, and a counselor, and then running to be a full-time politician as an MPP. And he, he didn't serve in cabinet, but he had a lot of wins for his community, both in terms of investment, helping families. I, I still meet people that had been help, that, who were helped by him during his, his years as MPP. So that, that would be one. Another leader I admire a great deal is, is Brian Mulroney. I think he, he brought some transformative policy changes when he was prime minister and as a result faced some deep criticism and, and you know, unpopularity. But sometimes if you think you're doing something for the, for the betterment of the country and its people, sometimes you have to put that, that put the country first before partisan or popularity considerations. Um, and so he was good enough to come out and help us in the last campaign in, in Quebec because we were trying to rebound the conservatives fortunes in that province a little bit and so he is someone that I saw in politics trying to do the best thing for the country not just the short-term politically expedient uh, option and unfortunately in this day and age we see far too much of that. Well I mean definitely politics um, there's a lot that happens in Canadian politics that is different than it may have been in the past and I mean difference not always bad but sometimes there's a, you need to sort of look at how can I make a difference for the better of everybody, even that may not, even though that may not be the popular word at the moment or the popular decision to make at that moment. It's still um, very important for the country as a whole. So yeah. we're going to go into the second question, which is a question that sort of focuses on, well, I'll, I'll just explain it. So what do you think is an issue that needs to be focused on more? I really think the, um, what, what might be called the cost of living crisis, um, we're seeing that now accelerate because of inflation at, at you know, three, four decade highs in Canada. You go to the grocery stores I did with my wife the other day and, and even buying simple things, everything's going up. One of the biggest things that I think is the increasing disparity between um, the lower incomes and the higher incomes that's going to lead to social social challenges as people feel like they're left behind as our economy is more transformed into a knowledge-based or service-based economy uh, professional services you're going to see potentially the development of, a, of an underclass which we've never really had in Canada where you'll have a number of people struggling to pay the bills never able to own a home uh, particularly in our large urban centers and I think that's going to build resentment towards uh, the system, towards other Canadians, towards politics. And I don't think people have addressed that. We tried to address this in the last campaign because our largest pledge was to actually uh, massively increase the Canada workers benefit. So that was a benefit for people at the lower income levels, allowing them to have more, more cash flow. So I often have many regrets of us not winning the election. Had we won the election, we would have implemented uh, support immediately for families uh, in daycare, Canadian workers benefit immediately, and we would have increased funds to rebuild our health system. The three things of which the Liberal government has not done, and as much as there was fanfare about a $10 daycare, uh, I just read in the Globe and Mail this morning, there's hundreds of daycares that have applied, aren't sure it's going to be applicable. So once again, it's another promise that won't be fulfilled by the Trudeau government. And I do think the lower incomes need more supports when it comes to childcare, when it comes to housing. And one of the proposals we had brought was this Canada workers benefit and a doubling of federal disability uh, supports. So if we don't address this, Vincenzo, we're going to see more uh, erosion of trust in politics and institutions, we're going to see perhaps more crime, and we're going to see this increasing split between the haves and the have-nots. And I think the best way to, to 
to ensure that people can can support themselves is uh, job training and the opportunity to work and provide for their families. And so the Canada Workers Benefit was like rewarding people for for work. I think there's dignity whether you're on the shop floor or in the boardroom. Well, I'm I'm just going to leave it at that. I mean, some some strong words there and some uh, lots of lots of ideas there. And I'm just going to leave it at that for this interview. So that is all for today. Thank you, Aaron, so much for joining me. If you liked today's interview, make sure to go check out my other interview with Aaron, uh, which will come out on Instagram on Top 5 and 5. If you're watching at the premiere, it will be coming out on Friday. Stay updated on Twitter, Instagram, and TikTok at VC Productions 25 Check my website, VincenzoCala.com. Make sure to like, subscribe, and get notifications here on YouTube. Let's Discuss Politics is a VCala production. So until the next video, I'm Vincenzo Cala, signing out.